Okay, everybody, uh, thank you for logging on. Uh, you're here for the AO Trauma North America Journal Club on both bone forearm fractures. Um, oh my God, we practice it and now I can't advance my slides. Here we go. So I'm Tom Krupka, that's me on the left there. I'm at the University of Florida in Gainesville. We have Erin Hofer here in the middle. Uh, she's at the Houston Clinic in Nashville, Tennessee, and Seth Phillips at, at Mercy uh, St. Vincent Hospital in Toledo, Ohio. These are, we are the moderators uh, for today's journal club. And then our faculty, our guest lecturers are gonna be uh, Dr. Emil Shemich, uh, Dr. Michael Chapman, and Dr. Lucas Marchand. Um, Really, thank you to everybody, uh, both Seth and Aaron, and then and then obviously all of our guest lecturers. Um, we have a really good panel today of folks that have, in their own eras, have all changed uh, both how we treat forearm fractures intraoperatively and postoperatively. And I think we're going to have a really, really good educational opportunity today. So disclosures, uh, none of us have any financial relationships at this point, with the exception of Dr. Shemich, uh, but this will be uh, a, uh, a presentation that's free of any kind of, of industry bias, so none of these disclosures should really be relevant for today. As far as the AO is concerned, we have multiple staff that are logged in to help technically, and, and if we have any kind of problems in that regard, they're, they're here to assist us. They don't have any disclosures at all. Uh, AO North America does receive some money, money from the AO Foundation and, and uh, Synthes, but again, um, we, we work very hard to keep these uh, free of, of industry bias. Um, AO North America, just a few points about AO. Uh, it's an independent nonprofit surgi surgical specialty uh, society that's uh, designed to really educate uh, physicians and, and thereby also improve the care of patients. Um, again, we don't endorse or promote any products or, or companies. Um, and everything that you see here, all the equipment that we're using today is, is strictly to enhance your educational experience. Um, and, and really, that's the main goal. Uh, Zoom etiquette. Uh, we have a lot of people logged on, so automatically everybody's microphones have been muted and video cameras are turned off. Um, please, if you have questions, we want folks to participate. Those make the best journal club. So use the Q&A box and not the chat box. The chat box can only really be seen by the moderators. If you have a question, type it into the Q&A box, um, and we'll go through the agenda here in a minute. But in the second half of the journal club, we'll have a, a, a nice discussion, and, and that's where we'll present any questions we get and, and hopefully get you the answers you need. Um, here is our agenda, so we're already well into that. Welcome. Um, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to go through all of our, our three interview uh, videos back to back to back. Uh, so and we're going to go um, in, in um, chronological order. So uh, first is going to be my interview with Dr. Chapman about compression plate fixation and acute fractures of the, the radius and ulna. Next is going to be Dr. Hofer and Dr. Shemich talking about radial bow. And finally, Dr. Phillips and Marchand talking about immediate weight bearing uh, and post-operative post both bone forearm fractures. So that's going to take roughly 30 minutes. Um, and then we're going to have about a 30 minute plus uh, Q&A session with the entire faculty. And we'll wrap up uh, somewhere around 9, 10, 9, 15, something like that. Um, at the end of this learning uh, experience, you're going to be able to hopefully recognize historical treatment algorithms and complications of both bone forearm fractures. You're going to be able to articulate the current goals of surgical treatment, and you're also going to uh, understand and maybe be able to apply some of the current post-operative protocols for both bone forearm fractures. A couple of little slides about uh, upcoming events and, and some of the educational material offered by AO. Uh, the next journal club is going to be on September 20th uh, on mangled extremities. Should be a, a good experience there. And then if you find this uh, opportunity, this educational opportunity to be, to be good, um, all of these get uploaded onto YouTube. So search AO Trauma North America on YouTube. There are tons and tons of journal clubs on there, really good content, really good interviews, and, and some, some great information. So it's all very easily accessible, and, and uh, go ahead and check that out at your convenience, uh, and you'll, you won't be disappointed. Um, and from there, um, I, I'm going to introduce my video uh, with, with Dr. Chapman. Dr. Chapman's logged on today. Uh, for starters, I, I ramble and talk and talk and talk. So I cut my first question down significantly. So the video starts halfway through it. 
Um, and uh, but I wanted to say thank you to Dr. Chapman for for providing us with the insights. Some of the historical references he's going to give us in this video were tremendous, uh, and and taking some time out of retirement to to teach us was was fantastic. So uh, the video is kind of quick hit and cut that way. All of them will be, um, but we can go ahead and start um, whenever you're ready, Chris. How boat bone forearm fractures were treated throughout your training and into your early practice and then later practice and, and how that treatment evolved and, and what, what role you played a part in, in both doing the treatment and, and changing it. Um, the radius tends to collapse towards the ulna if you make an attempt to treat it non-operatively. And I would say up until the time of that paper, which was, I'm thinking uh, it could have been late 30s, could have been middle 40s. What that paper established was that the incidence of loss of pronation and supination in the forearm when you didn't obtain anatomical alignment of the radius and the ulna was of such significance that they made the recommendation that they all be treated operatively. And uh, so that was a big turning point in the history of the treatment of forearm fractures. Well, by the time I started my training, which was um, 1962, uh, I entered the first year of my residency. And at that time, um, there were only really a couple plate fixation systems available and there was one that was small enough called the ACME system. And this was a, a smaller plate. And what you have to realize is that all of the original fixation devices, particularly in plates and screws, came straight out of the hardware store. So the screws were not designed for bone and the plates were very basic. I don't think anybody did any mechanical testing on them. And so the ACME plate worked, um, but it was hardly ideal. So along come the AO group in the late 1950s. And the way that I got introduced to this was my chief at the time, Robert Jameson, was a pretty aggressive guy. And when the AO first put their system on the market, which was in the uh, early 1960s, in order to get access to the AO system, which at that time was two little small red boxes containing um, a, the equivalent to a 3-5 plate system and the 4-5 system. And um, very basic. Uh, but in order to get access to it, it was felt to be so radical that you had to actually get on an airplane, fly to Davos, and take their basic introduction course on human bones. Yeah, and uh, so Bob Jamison came back to Highland, and he brought back this very basic system, which consisted, of course, of the 3-5 plate. Um, and it's with its outboard locking system. There was no inboard compression system in the screws then. They were oval holes. They had a plate that was sized appropriately for the job, and you had the ability to apply compression. And, and the principle of interfragmentary compression had been, you know, by that time, well described by Stefan Perrin. So with that, um, of course, most a lot of people in the United States started to use the AO system for the fixation of forearm fractures. And we were one of the pioneers because I think my, my chief, Bob Jamison, was at either the first or second course. As you know, the AO system remained quite controversial in the United States uh, up until probably the middle to late 1980s. Um, and the, the main reason for that was that um, a large contingent of the inventors of the AO system are not orthopedic surgeons, but general surgeons. That resulted in an entirely different approach to fracture care in that um, they didn't have the same kind of understanding of the musculoskeletal system that we did as orthopedic surgeons. 
And the end result of which is that once they discovered this wonderful way to fix bones, they started to fix everything. And they didn't have really good indications. And once that system was promoted in the United States and with that philosophy, they had a lot of complications, a lot of infections, a lot of non-unions, that sort of thing, because it wasn't being used. Uh, the indications were too aggressive. Okay. So at that time in the United States, when you said AO, what it meant was not, you know, the um, uh, Association for the Study of Internal Fixation, but rather always operate. <laughs> okay. okay. And uh, so in the forearm, uh, what happened was that a lot of surgeons not understanding the whole issue of stress protection and such, we're using the four or five plate on the forearm. And um, so the, the whole purpose of our paper uh, was really to, other than just look at general outcomes for fixation of fractures of the radius and ulna, was to show was there a difference between though the, the four or five plate and the uh, smaller plates? Yeah, okay. So, uh, you know, what we showed was that obviously both plate systems can adequately fix the forearm, but that the large screw hole sizes and probably the stress protection of the four or five plate is simply too much for the average forearm. And, uh, and that there was a pretty significant incidence of refracture uh, either at the end of the plate through the last screw hole or um, after plate removal, refracture was pretty darn common. Mm -hmm. And um, and then, of course, what we showed in our series is that using the three five plate, um, we had no refractures. Um, and so it just uh, you know was a more suitable plate, and of course the size was a lot better. Um, you know our results, even though it's a retrospective study with no no uh, uh, control group. The results were excellent. 98% uh, of the fractures united and 92% achieved an excellent or satisfactory functional result based on, um, you know, the, the loss of supination pronation. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could expand upon where bone grafting fit in for you in your practice, both early and as time went on as well. Because I was working in a level one trauma center, um, the severity of the trauma that we were seeing was much higher than you'd see in the average hospital. So we had a lot larger number of open fractures and severely comminuted fractures than the average practice. And uh, we just thought uh, ounce of prevention was much better than trying to treat a non-union. But the other technique we used again was just a little stab wound over the anterior superior iliac spine make a small drill hole and then just reach in with a curette and scoop out because you don't need much graft. Okay. And uh, that's very non-invasive. Uh, patients hardly even noticed it. And um, so that was more, was our routine. And, um, and then we just routinely, I think pretty much added that to any fracture that showed a lot of soft tissue stripping, uh, a fracture that was a high grade open fracture or one that was comminuted with loss of bone substance. Is there anything in, in particular that, that you thought would be a valuable teaching point that, I, that we haven't talked about yet or that hasn't come up? I do mention the technique we used for fixing fractures. Um, at the time, there was um, most surgeons would try to pre-assemble the fracture. Um, they try to reduce it, put comminuted pieces back in place, uh, maybe fix it with multiple K wires or try to hold it with bone clamps. And then they would apply the plate once the mm -hmm. fracture was reduced. Our approach was entirely different. What we would do was um, we would figure out where the best location for the plate was. And we would attach the plate to one fragment first. So it was secure on that fragment. Then we would assemble the entire fracture to that plate bone combination. And that made it much easier to do, much simpler. 
uh, much quicker. And uh, it rarely ever interfered with getting an anatomical reduction. I could, there are a couple of tricks on plate removal, by the way, that are worth, re, worth mentioning. There's always a little ridge of bone that has grown up mm -hmm. around the edge of the plate and into the screw holes. So after you take it out, the bone's quite rough in that area because of that. And it's pretty common for fastidious, obsessive compulsive surgeons to get their chisel out and to smooth that all up because uh, it feels better and it's, you know, the patient's more comfortable. That's a mistake. And the reason for that is that those ridges and those, those little protuberances around the screw holes um, increase the strength of the bone. Um, and so it's much better to leave them and then let the body gradually remodel, remodel them as the rest of the bone gains strength. Hi, Dr. Shemich. Thanks for joining us for this. Um, I guess I'll start with kind of the standard question for papers. Uh, why did you decide to study this? Well, I think back in the day, um, it was well recognized that um, if you fixed uh, forearm fractures with um, plates, you got a better outcome. Um, the union rate was high, um, but malunion was still an issue. We, you know, believed that, you know, in fixing a forearm fracture, you had to get the bone out to length. You had to make sure there was no angular deformity, no rotational deformity. Uh, we talked about philosophically, um, you know, restoring the normal radial bow, but there was no real um, sort of agreed upon method to do just that. And um, in doing the study, we wanted to develop a reliable technique that was simple, reproducible, and would allow you to measure that. Um, and then at the same time, obviously wanted to see just what kind of an impact um, restoration of the normal bow uh, would have versus, you know, if you had a um, malreduction or a malunion. The measurement technique is, you know, pretty straightforward. Again, um, you know, if you're going to do it, you want to typically do a shoot through um, AP um, and um, you're going to have the arm in neutral rotation when you're um, taking the x-ray and um, you basically draw a line from the bicipital tuberosity to the most medial aspect of the distal um, radius, uh, the distal radial ulnar joint, and then you find the, um, the point of maximum bow, and that's typically 60% of the way from the velocity down in the distal radius, and draw perpendicular that point, and the two minutes are the length of the perpendicular, and the point at which the perpendicular um, is uh, along that long line, so 60% of the on the line, and then the measurement is around um, 15 um, millimeters or so. Um, so those are sort of the two measurements. And the nice thing about the technique um, is it's easy to do. It's easy to, it's reproducible. You can do it, you know, in the OR, you can do it with a fluoro machine, you can do it with, uh, um, you know, conventional x-rays. Uh, I think the other um, important thing, um, like when I <clears throat> started this study, um, you know, we were, doing AP and lateral um, x-rays and um, you know the it was pretty common practice to ask the patient to sort of put their forearm um, um, either pronated or supinated on the cassette and then take a picture. Um, mm -hmm. One thing we learned was that um, particularly if you're evaluating patients um, post-op you know often patients will have lost supination and pronation so really the only reliable way um, to get a proper AP is to um, get a shoot through AP. So if you are in um, neutral rotation, um, so not pronated or supinated, um, you know, that position is pretty much achievable by any, by all patients pretty much, um, unless there's extenuating circumstances. So rather than, you know, putting the arm pronated or supinated on the cassette and then taking a picture to get an AP, you put the arm in the neutral position and then do a shoot through um, AP. So in your practice now, since this paper has come out and over the years since, x-rays preoperatively, do you always get contralateral x-rays in the operating room preoperatively? Do you sometimes get them 
or is it an always thing? Um, I, I wouldn't say um, routinely getting x-ray of both forms. I think if you're not sure, so like for example, you know, if you've got a segmental fracture, you've got a lot of comminution and you really don't understand the anatomy well preoperatively, then I think it's good to get, um, you know, the opposite side as kind of a check. I mean, if it's a very simple fracture and you're going to understand it and kind of be able to reduce it anatomically in the OR and understand, you know, what the keys to reduction are, then in general, we don't, um, you know, preoperatively get that imaging. If there's any concern, um, you know, in the surgery, you can always, you know, image the opposite side. Um, but it's really for the, you know, more complex fracture patterns, um, segmental fractures, significant, you know, comminution over a longer zone that um, get an X-ray of the opposite side. And so were you surprised by the results? Well, I was somewhat surprised. Um, I mean, I, I had kind of figured that it was important to um, restore, quote unquote, the normal bow. But um, after this study, um, it sort of left me with the sense that you really had to anatomically um, restore um, the bow and that, um, you know, sort of being close wasn't good enough. And it's almost like, um, you know, a joint, um, you know, between two bones mm -hmm. and that if you don't sort of have um, it well reduced, then you can expect to have not as good an outcome. So sort of really emphasized to me that when you're reducing these fractures, you're really um, aiming for an anatomic reduction. I think it was interesting too that it wasn't a, a linear pattern. So whenever the you guys did the analysis, it showed that it was kind of an all or nothing. Um, if you're outside of that certain bow, then patients lost rotation um, or lost grip strength. It wasn't just a, it wasn't uh, if you were a little bit off, then they lost a little bit. If you were a lot off, they lost a lot. It was just if they if it was off, then they definitely lost some strength and rotation. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, in the measurement of magnitude of um, uh, radial bow, um, like normal is around, you know, 15 millimeters um, or so. And you want it to be with pretty much within about a millimeter or so, um, uh, millimeter and a half. And then, you know, when it was double that, you, you started to saw, see dramatic, you know, deterioration in function. And it was not a linear relationship. So, if you're pretty much anatomic, you had a you know good outcome, 80% of normal um, form rotation or, or grip strength. If you were just you know a couple of millimeters worse, so it's not like it was a centimeter off. If you were 2.8 millimeters off, as I recall, um, then you know the outcome um, you know was significantly worse. And it's similarly, you know, with the location of the um, maximum bow is usually typically about 60% of the way um, along the bow. And, you know, if you're off by about 4% or less, then your outcome, you know, was better. If it was 8% or more, then, you know, you started to see significant deterioration in function. So, so um, it didn't take much to worsen um, the outcome. And, you know, as soon as you were sort of beyond that threshold, the, you know, the outcomes really deteriorated um, significantly. I talked in your paper about contouring plates and that being kind of a, a need in these type of fractures. Is there a specific way that you contour your plates? Kind of patient by patient, sort of looking at what it is that you're, um, you know, trying to achieve. Find that um, if you're going to put the plate, it's a lot easier to put the plate on the volar surface than like putting it um, radially. I find that's a really difficult thing mm -hmm. um, to do if you're contouring. So I think having it on the flatter volar surface um, is easier, but um, I mean, at the end of the day, um, you don't want to under contour, you don't want to over contour. Um, you really, you don't want to get an anatomic um, reduction. And, you know, I, <clears throat> again, going into the study, um, I had kind of thought that, you know, if um, you sort of um, decreased the bow, that would be the problem. So there would be impingement between the the radius and the ulna, and that would re result in restricted form rotation. Mm -hmm. But we actually found that, um, you know, if you increase the bow, so even if you've got like good clearance, um, yeah. the problem is you still wind up with loss of motion. And that may be because, you know, everything's kind of um, tensioned, um, tethered, and almost, you know, pulled too tight. So,
So um, you're kind of not wanting to increase the bow um, or decrease the bow. It's, it's restoring the normal bow. And then that means obviously using appropriate contouring of the plate. And in some instances, you know, it's, it's a bit of under contouring. In some instances, maybe a bit of over contouring. Um, and then I know this, the paper specifically talks about radial bow, but uh, one of my attendings and uh, fellowship always like to say that the biggest lie in orthopedics is that the ulna is a straight bone. So do you find that you're uh, contouring the ulnar plates often or um, in which surface of the ulna do you plate generally? Um, again, you know, that's a, you know, a really good point. I think to some degree, um, you know, depends on the, you know, fracture pattern. I think we're learning lots about, um, you know, the, the only, certainly not a, um, a straight bone. And I can remember, you know, being a fellow and we would, you know, for example, for proximal ulna fractures, you know, we wouldn't recognize, for example, the PUDA mm -hmm. in the proximal um, ulnar dorsal angulation. And so we'd have the plate straight. Um, meanwhile, it's got, you know, probably about a six degree um, bend to it in that plane. And there's also a little bit of an S curve in the um, ulna as well. So if you're not kind of taking that into account, um, then again, you're setting yourself up for um, a malreduction. I don't really have a strong feeling um, in terms of where the ulnar plate should sit. A lot of times it depends on the fracture pattern. I think one of the other points was uh, regarding removal of hardware in these patients. And there were a few refractures after removal of hardware. And um, there were recommendations then to... Uh, wait for after a year and splint postoperatively. Is that still kind of the, is that what you follow now? Yeah, I mean, I would even say, um, you know, wait longer than a year myself. Like personally, trying to avoid taking the hardware out at all. Um, I think that, you know, in the good old days, um, you know, when people were using larger plates and larger screws, um, you know, like four or five implants, um, I think you were seeing more um, refractures, but I think in the forearm, you know, the bone probably doesn't remodel to be normal, you know, until almost two years. Like there's some evidence that at about 21 months, it's quote unquote back to normal. So I think even at a year, it's, it's early. The paper also looked at sort of the outcomes of both bones, forearm fractures. And I mean, there's a whole, you know, a whole bunch of other factors that influence outcome too, right? So we I mean, can't just hang your hat on radial bow. So, you know, patients that have open fractures don't, you know, do as well. Patients that have crush injuries don't typically do as well. Patients that have segmental fractures of bone loss, um, you know, don't do as well. Um, but all things, you know, being equal, it's important to restore the bow. All right, so let's dive into this paper a little bit. This is published in August of 2021 in the JAOS. Um, really, we'll kind of get down to it, but you guys looked at, at weight bearing um, in the polytrauma setting, specifically at, at both bone forearm fractures. Um, where did kind of the idea and, and the drive for this paper come from when you guys were sitting down and putting this together? This is a paper that I did while I was uh, in fellowship in Baltimore, Maryland at, at Shock Trauma. And one thing that I had noticed during my fellowship is the unique manner in which the surgeons there fix both bone form fractures, which is sort of highlighted throughout the manuscript that we're reviewing today in terms of the eight cortices of purchase, proximal and distal to the fracture. And it brought about the question of why we did that. And uh, the reason I was told was to allow for immediate weight bearing in these patients because of the disproportionate amount of polytraumatized patients they cared for. This allowed for immediate weight bearing and to improve patient mobilization. The first question was, why are we fixing these fractures like this? <laughs> and then once you figured out sort of some of the justification, reasoning and thought process behind that uh, surgical tactic, the next obvious question in my mind was, well, how do these people do when we prescribe them this protocol? So that was sort of the genesis of the study. Sure. You know, one of the things in the beginning of the paper you guys hit on right away is, is these were defined as, you know, fractures of necessity, right? I mean, for the most part, I would assume, um, like you guys touched on, it's usually six weeks of, of non-weight bearing um, with, you know, maybe a splint initially to let things calm down, let the incisions heal. But I'd say that's pretty much standard of care if, if you kind of check in across the country. Um, is that a fair assumption, you think? 
Yeah, that's certainly how we treated them um, when I was in residency. But I do think most people are keeping these as uh, non-weight bearing for a period of at least six weeks, or at least sure. they were prior to this paper being published. Um, and one of the things you guys highlight really well in this paper is is the big difference between an isolated injury, whether that's both bone form or whatever, versus the the polytrauma setting. And you know, you guys highlighted how important upper extremities are for you know assistive devices, you know, walker crutches, that kind of thing. And you know how much that changes. It, it's easy if someone has an isolated both bone form to tell them not to use the arm for six weeks versus you know, in lower extremity injuries, and you rely on that even just to get out of bed, that, that's a whole nother thing, right? And and you touched on the increased risk of potential complications and everything that goes with it. Um, your hypothesis that you could fix with a little more robust fixation um, and allow them to use this and, and make it through with no um, additional complications. Um, your methods were were pretty straightforward. You, you looked at the you know adult population. You looked at your isolated and the also polytrauma settings. Um, and then one thing you guys did that was was kind of cool was created this scoring method um, that you know designed to try to account for how much additional stress I guess the upper extremities would see based on the degree of lower extremity injury. Um, I thought that was a pretty neat thing. How did you guys kind of come up with that and, and and apply that for this? Yeah, it was something where we're kind of looking at it and not all polytrauma patients are created equal and not everybody was going to be as reliant on their upper extremity for mobility. Um, and so this was the simplest way to sort of create a quote unquote score for the amount for the amount of kind of reliance somebody would have on their upper extremity. So just to kind of briefly summarize what we did is the weight bearing is tolerated was zero. Uh, partial weight bearing was given a score of one and then strict non weight bearing was given a score of two. We scored the two legs and then gave you sort of an overall risk stratification for the amount of um, reliance you may have on or dependence you may have on your upper extremity for mobility. So your collection period was January of 07 through the end of uh, 2016. Um, total looks like you guys had just over 300 um, fractures treated um, with just over 200, 213 um, included in the study. Um, pretty pretty good follow up of of mean follow up of forty six weeks. I mean, we know how our our trauma population are maybe not always the most reliable in, in that arena. Um, and then your surgical technique you touched on you know already briefly. Like you said, you used a a three five LCDC plate on both radius and ulna for about ninety percent of the time, um, and then incorporated things like a, a two seven plate or, or a, they mentioned locking plates um, about ten percent. One thing was the the eight cortices on either side. Um, so it sounds like that was something they were doing, you know, well before this study, correct? Yeah, I mean, they, they'd been doing this for years. The guy who's been around there the longest started doing this and al allowing people to immediately uh, weight bear on their upper extremity following their injury uh, going way back. And so it's sort of been the standard of care at that trauma center for for decades um and then the post-op protocol was was a soft dressing and, and let them kind of get after it right away i guess we can kind of get down to it um the outcomes um primarily we're looking at if there was any increased post-operative complications essentially 11 out of the 213 had some form of of complication with an overall 5.2 percent risk which is not uh, unacceptably high by any means, with the most common being a deep surgical site infection. I mean, obviously, a lot of that's out of our control with open fractures with just a degree of soft tissue injury and, and those kind of things. Um, the, the interesting numbers, I thought, were that four um, of the 11 complications were in the isolated versus seven in the polytrauma, and that when you looked at all the different potential complications, there was no statistical differences, right? So, I mean, essentially, you know, you guys showed that it's it's pretty safe and that it doesn't put you at increased risk following the the principles that we've already kind of laid out, looking through the physical therapy notes or those kind of things. About 72% of the polytrauma patients were documented in at least one way or the other to have, you know, used the arm for weight bearing. And, you know, I know when we do a lot of these studies, some of the problem is just the documentation itself. So, if if you found proof in 72%, there's probably even more than that that just maybe there wasn't evidence of. But, I mean, that's a pretty good number, right? Even if we take that at face value, you know, 
three fourths of your patients are actually using their arm to weight bear and get around, which, so, I mean, this is something that's definitely, you know, has an impact on everybody's practice. The, the other number that, that I thought kind of jumped out was less than 2% rate of implant failure. Right. And I mean, to me, that's the thing that I would worry about and, you know, jumps into mind if you're immediately weight bearing on something that's historically had six weeks of, of rest and healing before you really, you know, get after it and stress it. So, um, the limitations that you mentioned were retrospective, which I mean, you know, is what it is. Um, you mentioned that they were very selective in the population. So, you know, the, the things with, you know, anatomic reduction had to have absolute stability, um, and the fixation, I guess one question I had for you was, you know, that's not always possible in some of these fracture patterns. So how did you guys manage or kind of apply these same principles to ones that you were building, maybe more of a bridging construct and that kind of thing? Yeah, for ones that had a bridging construct, but no um, like segmental bone defect, as long as they had eight cortices of fixation on either side of that spanned um, area of comminution or zone of comminution, they're still included in the study and they're still allowed to wait for as tolerated both when I was in fellowship and in my current practice. In the ones where there is a zone of comminution that's non-reconstructable, so long as appropriate fixation can be, be achieved proximal and distal to fracture. I still think it's safe to wait there, but that number overall in this study, the number of that type of fracture would be very small. Okay. So comminution, you know, is not a, a deal breaker by any means. Correct. You know, the other question was, you know, 90% being all three, five plays. Do you feel like that's kind of reflective of your current practice or are you starting to incorporate you know, two seven plates into the ulna and, and some females or petite, you know, adults? Yeah, I am still a, unless the fracture gets um, quite distal, I'm still a 3-5 um, DCP plate on both the radius and ulna, sort of regardless of patient size or habitat. And then, you know, we've kind of touched on it already, but the whole idea of, of the, you know, eight cortices, um, I mean, it sounds like from a historic perspective, it, it's done very, very well at a, you know, awesome trauma institution. Um, do you feel like there'd be any um, issues with just doing like a standard six courtesy? I think for me, I would probably be comfortable doing it. The reason being is something we haven't necessarily touched on yet is I bet a fair amount of these people self-limit. And I bet the same thing happens in the lower extremity, which is why the papers that have reported on lower extremity weight bearing have not really shown a difference with immediate weight bearing protocols, because I bet there's some self-protective uh, mechanism that happens in people that are painful. They don't keep weight bearing on the extremity. So I think it probably would be fine. Anything else you would you would do in this kind of scenario that in your practice now or, or from you know this paper that you would you would add? I, I think there's two questions. One is six cortices enough. So maybe prospectively following, you know, a select group of surgeons who pick six cortices sure. and allow for immediate weight bearing would be one question. I think the second question that would be fun to answer is like, yes, I'm allowing you to weight bear and are in fact you actually weight bearing on the arm and using it to aid in mobility. No, I, I definitely agree. I mean, I have that conversation with our residents a lot that you know, maybe somebody comes in and, and the, the construct's held up, but, but like you said, is it really because it held up or is it because it just wasn't tested, you know, and if they're not really using it, are we making too many assumptions? I think that's a, that's a really great point. I really appreciate the insight. Thank you so much for taking the time to join this and um, any uh, closing remarks you want to get in before we wrap this up? No, I'd just like to thank the, my co-authors on the paper, you know, nothing happens in isolation with one person. And uh, I'm just merely the person that wrote the manuscript and put the story together, but I couldn't have done it without everybody else's help. So I appreciate them. And thanks to the AO for putting this together and finding this article interesting. This is cool to be invited to do, so appreciate it. All right, fantastic. Well, so that was a quick run through of, of all those papers. Really, again, thanks everybody for putting those together. There's a lot of great information there. Um, the first thing I'd like to do, uh, Dr. Shemich, I know you weren't able to log on earlier. Thank you for coming even with what you got going on this week. But um, you, your video got a little uh, scratchy where you were talking about how you made your measurements for radial bow. Can you 
quickly run through that real quick because most of that got missed just because of bad internet connection. Sure, no problem. Um, so um, I think the key um, is to do um, a shoot through AP with the arm in neutral rotation. So typically uh, when an x-ray of the forearm is done, um, you're often fully supinated or fully pronated. But one of the problems with um, uh, both bones forearm fractures and their fixation is you will sometimes lose forearm rotation. But what is consistent is the ability to get the arm to neutral. So uh, step one is to have the arm in neutral position. And then when you're doing your um, shoot through AP, um, that allows you to get um, a consistent x-ray that's reproducible every time. So um, you shoot through, get that x-ray, um, which is um, an AP x-ray of the forearm. Um, and then that enables you to measure radial bow. And the technique that we described um, in our paper um, was to use that view, draw um, a line from the most uh, medial aspect of the bicipital tuberosity um, down to the um, distal radius, most um, ulnar aspect. So that's a, um, a longitudinal line that's drawn. And then you look at the bow of the radius and you essentially uh, pick the point where the bow is maximum. Um, and that's about 60% of the way from the bicipital tuberosity down to the distal radius. So at that point, you drop a perpendicular. And um, the two measurements are um, magnitude of maximum radial bow, which is a, a measurement in millimeters. So that um, perpendicular measurement is around um, 15 millimeters. Um, and then where the bow, to, where that perpendicular is um, along the length of that longitudinal line is the location of maximum radial bow. And that consistently is around the 60% uh, point. So that's the two measurements that um, that we made and described in that paper. Perfect. And the, the, there's a couple really great schematics in the paper itself. So if that's a confusing thing to, to to hear, just looking at the pictures makes it all make a, a lot of sense. So that's what I'd recommend if anybody wants to look into that more. Um, but I'll, I'll kick it off with a question. Then we have a, a question in the, the Q&A that we'll, we'll get to next. I know we had Plate removal came up a little bit intermittently in a few of the videos, um, and specifically some of the historic papers where four or five plates were being uh, removed. I think it was an Anderson uh, paper, it was a lead author in 1975 at about a 25-ish percent rate of fracture after removal of hardware of four or five plates, which led Dr. Chapman's article, uh, which obviously had no refracture with a three five plate, right? Um, just wondering uh, for the whole panel, where does hardware removal fit in your practice now? Does it have a place? And if it does, where is it? You want me to talk first? Sure. <laughs> yeah, I've been retired 22 years, so it plays no, no role in my life at all. <laughs> <laughs> but um, um, as Dr. Semish said, um, we, never, we, we never routinely removed hardware. Uh, particularly, um, you know, uh, dual plates in the forearm. Uh, the only indication we had was uh, either the patient didn't want the plate or they had symptoms from the plate and insisted on us removing them. Or the patient was engaging in a very high risk activity. Let's say take hockey, for example, they're a pro hockey player. Uh, then after a, a fairly prolonged period of time, as Dr. Shemis pointed out, typically around 18 to 24 months, we take it out. And the, the problem is timing, of course, because once it comes out, you know, the risk of refracture is pretty significant. So we'd always do it for a sports guy at the end of the season and then make them, you know, protect that, take some time off before they got back into their preseason practice. Yeah, I, I would basically echo that. I mean, I, I have consistently tried not to take uh, forearm plates um, off unless absolutely necessary. And more often than not, um, you know, it's in a um, sporting athlete. Um, I, I think if you're going to take the plates off, you really want to wait as long as possible. I would say the earliest would be um, 18 months. Um, you know, typically it would be more in the two year range. Um, there's some evidence that suggests that it takes almost two years for the bone to remodel to normal. So I think in that um, first 18 months, for sure, it's at um, risk of refracture. 
I would say this, the change from four five to three five plates really um, you know, had a substantial um, impact in reducing the risk of refracture, but it didn't eliminate it. Um, and so I, I think um, you still wanna be very careful, um, wait two years, and then certainly if they're gonna get um, you know, back to sporting activity, um, you wanna give them um, a period of time uh, you know, for the, the bone again to sort of, um, you know, let the screw holes um, fill in some so that you're at reduced risk of a, of a fracture. So I usually protect them for at least three months um, after hardware removal. Uh, on that same topic, topic, I have a question for Dr. Marchand. Um, the, um, uh, I haven't put one of these plates in now for 20 years, but when we were doing them, um, we routinely try to use a unicortical screw at the end, both ends of the plate. The idea being that, you know, you had a little more transition of the uh, mechanics of the bone and hopefully reduce the risk of fracture through that area, e either before plate removal or say after plate removal, although uh, certainly before. And I noticed that, that you talked about either using eight cortices or six cortices. So what is the situation today with using a unicortical screw? Is that dead now or what's the story on that? Yeah, I have seen that um, primarily historically, the unicortical screw at the end of constructs, both in the upper and lower extremity for, I imagine the reason you refer to sort of a transition of the stiffness of the construct into the native bone. Um, but I see that I think less commonly. It's not something that I do. And definitely in the upper extremity, if I'm going to let a uh, patient weight bear, trying to get as many cortices of purchase as possible. And I, my guess is I have only seen once somebody fracture around the distal end of a plate in a form. Again, I, I'm early in my career, so that's not saying a whole lot, but, and it was in a high energy trauma. I imagine that the transition from four five to three five plating in the forearm um, decrease to some degree the level of stress riser while the implants are in place and decrease the risk of fracture while hardware is retained and so i haven't seen that much with three five screws and i haven't seen the the unicortical construct um in more present uh, practices or presentations that i've seen I'd agree with that. I, I mean, I, I must say, I honestly don't think the unicortical versus bicortical at the end makes a difference um, in terms of outcome. Um, you know, the fractures typically aren't at the end of the plate, um, typically. Um, and um, in my own practice, again, I, I kind of agree with the notion of eight cortices on either side. So um, I would actually um, use eight cortices as opposed to six. So um, that kind of mirrors my practice as well. Yeah, and when it comes to harder removal, I was going to just chime in. I don't have much to add that hadn't already been said, other than frequently I may try to talk the patient into removing the ulnar plate because that seems to be symptomatic and bothersome. And there are sometimes, in my mind, because of that, an indication to remove it. But the radial plate, I feel, is very infrequently symptomatic or problematic for patients. So if I'm taking out the ulnar plate, I don't routinely also take out the radial plate. I may just leave um, the radial plate in. Can I add a quick historical comment? Um, when you uh, came in on the video, that little section kind of got cut off. And I think for your viewers, they might find this little bit of history interesting. The, uh, the change from non-operative treatment in North America to operative treatment of forearm fractures occurred in 1957. And um, the thing that did that was the Piedmont Society study. And at that time, an isolated fracture of the distal third of the radius was known as a Piedmont fracture uh, because of the paper out of the Piedmont Orthopedic Society. Today, it's known as a Galeazzi fracture. There's some argument about whether a Piedmont does not involve the distal radial ulnar joint, whereas a Galeazzi does. But I don't think anybody uses the term Piedmont anymore. But the importance of this paper, it was published by Jack Houston in the American uh, Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery in 1957, volume 39A, page 
249. It was titled Fracture of the Distal Radial Shaft Mistakes in Management. And what they did, the Piedmont Orth Orthopedic Society was founded in 1953. And as best I can tell, it's pretty much the Alumni Association of the Orthopedic Program at Duke University. Um, and over the many, many years, it has grown into a fairly large number of people. May have involved other people at the time, but I'm not sure about it. So they were, this was at a time when in the 50s, we're just out of World War II. And basically everything in the way of fractures in the United States was being treated non-operatively with the exception of uh, subcapital hip fractures, simple intertrochanteric fractures, and intraarticular fractures. But almost all shaft fractures, including the form, were being treated in casts. Uh, and we had lots of books about how to do that to be sure that you could main molding to maintain the bow the radius. So the Piedmont Orthopedic Society said, you know, we're not sure that's working out. So they did a retrospective study, went out to their membership, and just compared all the fractures treated closed versus those that were treated with plates. And what they proved, of course, was that plate fixation was vastly superior. So that's where the term fracture of necessity came from, came out of that paper. And um, so the that more or less, at least in the forearm, set the scene for almost mandate, well, close to mandatory operative fixation of this particular group of fractures. And of course, the timing was perfect. Uh, and at the time, again, we still all we had were these acne plates. And of course, it was right at that time that the AO group was working on their new plate fixation system. And I think it went on the market through this Davos course in I think 61 or 62. So the timing was perfect. So I think everybody in the United States, in North America was happy to see that plate come along for fixing forearm pressures. Excellent. Yeah, that, that's really helpful to understand the, the background of how we ended up where we got the um, uh, we do have a couple questions in the in the Q and A. We'll start with um, um, Greg. One of the participants said, "Even with small imperfections with anatomical reduction, do you think patients are able to accommodate and be very satisfied with their outcome?" So I think it's most of the outcomes we talked about were were pro and supination and and um, range of motion uh, based. But what does that translate to functionally and, and from a patient satisfaction standpoint? Can you guys all touch touch on on what what your opinions are there? I mean, I, I think, again, it kind of depends on, you know, what it is that you're looking for um, in terms of outcome. And the, the paper that we wrote on, you know, the impact of restoration of radial bow, um, you know, back 30 years ago, um, you know, we didn't have the, um, you know, detailed proms that we, we currently have. So, um, you know, most of the, um, you know, outcomes that we used were, you know, physician-based. Um, so we had a very simple... Um, you know, outcome grading system in there. And then we looked at grip strength and um, form rotation. And, and presumably, you know, if a patient um, has restoration of form uh, motion and has, um, you know, um, a restoration of grip strength, you know, to some degree, um, you know, they're going to be happy. Um, now, is it correlation perfect? Uh, no. Um, you know, and I think, um, you know, that's an area again, where, you know, maybe um, we need a little bit more data, you know, and there's been a lot of work um, also done, you know, for example, in quantifying bow in the ulna, you know, uh, coronal and, um, you know, sagittal bow um, and so forth. So, um, I mean, all I can say is, is that I think if you look at um, the forearm, it functions to some degree um, like um, uh, an intraarticular, like a joint. And so if you restore, um, you know, the anatomy anatomically, you're going to have um, a better outcome. And certainly, I mean, you know, in our study, um, you know, we were sort of um, finding that, you know, if you restored maximum bow to within about a millimeter and a half and the location, um, you know, to within, you know, about four or five percent, um, you know, your results were better. So. Um, you know, does it have to be perfect? Um, 
I don't know. I think, um, you know, if it's close to perfect, you're probably going to have a, a good result. I think if you're off some, you're probably going to really find um, your results deteriorating um, in a hurry. And I mean, we kind of found that it was a bit of an all or none phenomenon. Like if you um, increase the bow, decrease the bow, then it sort of matter. I went into the study sort of thinking that you know, if we um, decrease the bow, you'd get impingement and patients would be um, unhappy. But if you increased it, it wouldn't be a problem because there wouldn't be impingement. It didn't matter what you did. If the anatomy was off some, then your outcome wasn't as good. So bottom line, I think if you restore the anatomy, you can expect a, a better outcome that's going to translate into things like improved rotation and grip strength. And that should translate um, into patient better patient reported outcome. Uh, can I hit Emil with a follow-up question to that? The um, Emil, um, as you know, um, you can compensate for loss of uh, pronation by simply abducting the shoulder some. And you can't compensate uh, very successfully for loss of supination. Did you differentiate that at all in your paper? No, we didn't. We just looked at um, forearm uh, rotation as a composite of both pronation and supination. Didn't specifically um, look at it. I, as I recall, I, I didn't find it a trend towards one or the other. It may have just been, you know, the injuries um, and so forth. Um, we strictly looked at forearm rotation as the outcome. And then we have a couple chat questions, both about uh, different plate screw constructs. So the first one was uh, uh, thoughts on 90-90 plating with additional mini frag style 2.4 millimeter plates. Um, and if so, um, any modified considerations for hardware removal um, or desired number of cortices if you're adding a secondary plate? Uh, I do a fair amount of mini fragment augmentation of my plate of my primary plate fixation so uh, oftentimes particularly in transverse fracture patterns i may use a straight straight reduction clamp or a mini fragment plate to hold a provisional reduction while i apply a 3.5 plate um, but it doesn't i don't consider those cortices um, important when making a decision in terms of like post-operative weight bearing uh, cause I'm usually using like a two O plate. Don't know that there's typically enough room on the forearm for something larger, like a two seven plate. I worry a little bit about soft tissue stripping as you get into a larger caliber plate. Um, so it doesn't come into play for me and it would not affect my decision, um, to remove hardware as, as others have stated, I would try to avoid hardware removal on the forearm unless uh, symptomatic or some other compelling reason. I, I don't have much to add. I mean, I, I typically um, don't use uh, many fragment plates um, in this area. I typically tend to use um, the single plate. And as I said before, I, I try and aim for eight cortices um, on either side of the fracture. Well, and speaking of cortices, the next question is, do you guys vary the number of cortices that you shoot for based on the inherent stability or instability of the fracture? Um, and so the, this uh, Christopher McAndrew is saying that uh, Claude Saji wrote a paper suggesting that four cortices is enough, is it not? And I think at least a couple of you are gonna say, no, you're gonna double that up. But um, what about four? Well, the, the only thing I would say to that um, is I think when you're talking cortices, um, you also have to talk plate length. Um, so I think four cortices, um, you know, on either side of the fracture in a four hole plate um, is different than four cortices on either side of the fracture with an eight hole plate or a 10 hole plate. So um, I think plate length um, also um, plays a role and certainly you know with a longer plate, you can probably get away with less cortices. Um, so um, you know, I, so for example, even the conversation around the six cortices, like using an eight hole plate with six cortices is probably a different story than a six hole plate with six cortices. Um, so, so I think when you're talking cortices, um, you do have to talk plate length. Um, I think it's an area that's, um, you know, controversial as was said, um, you know, half an hour ago. Um, you know, I think it's an area that probably um, requires some um, study, um, you know, in terms of clinical work. Um, uh, 
there's not a lot of comparative um, evidence, um, you know, in this area. Um, before going down to four cortices, I'd probably like to see that six works. Um, so myself, um, I like the, um, you know, the eight cortices on either side, as I've said a couple of times now. But I, I think I'd be prepared to go down to six. Um, four seems um, like pushing it. Um, and certainly if I were going to go four, it would be in a really longer plate. So who's going to be yeah, the I, who do the weight bearing uh, with six cortices? Is that going to be you, Dr. Marchand? Well, I, I think I, I have a couple comments to Dr. McAndrew. So one is I, I, there is that Saji paper that suggests that there are other biomechanical papers that suggest, you know, six cortices or three screws, three bicortical screws on either side provide the most amount of kind of torsional stiffness. Um, so maybe you could get away with four. I think that would undoubtedly be pushing the envelope. And oftentimes people um, or people can strip screws in the OR or lose a little bit of purchase by over tightening them. So it's nice to have some screws um, as backup. You know, if you do that to one screw in a four screw construct, then you really only have one good screw on one side of a fracture, which I think would be um, concerning. So there's there's that. The other question you have to ask yourself is what, and this was something we talked about in my video, but I think because of time constraints got edited out, I was like, what are the downsides of additional cortices? So downsides for me are increased incision length usually because more cortices, more screws typically means a longer plate for me. So increased incision length, slightly increased operative time, and maybe increased expense, although we all know cortical screws are fairly um, fairly cheap and affordable. In the upper extremity, I think the arm is relatively, um, it, it tolerates large surgical incisions well. It's relatively uh, less prone to get infected than the lower extremity. So slightly larger surgical incision is not a huge downside for me. The cost is minimal. And I think the added time is also minimal. And so not a whole lot of downside. Like I don't see a, a huge upside in pushing the envelope to go in the other direction for fewer cortices. There are publications to suggest that six cortices are enough. That that is some of the the other the older cohorts of both bone form fractures were treated in that manner, and they would demonstrate you know union rates at ninety to ninety five percent. So we know that that will work to um, unite your fracture. The question is, is the added benefit of eight cortices allow you to immediately weight bear and maybe let the patient use the arm with a little bit more um, confidence than if you have six cortices? That's what we don't know. Um, that is a study for the future, but a little less imperative of a study from my perspective because there are minimal downsides, I think, to the eight cortices. And so for me, I will continue that way. If somebody shows that six cortices is enough to weight bear, I will probably change my practice. Um, but I, but again, there's not a whole lot of downside. A slightly increased incision length, maybe slightly longer surgical time, not a whole lot of cost difference that I can think of. So that, that leads me to a question that I had written down is what exactly does weight bearing mean to you and your practice? Or are you routinely letting folks weight bear weight through their palms with a walker or crutches? Are you using platform walkers? Um, and like some of what you guys talked in your video with your scoring system for trying to gauge stress on the forearms with a bilateral lower extremity injury, they're probably putting less stress on than if they have a single extremity and they're getting up with a walker and you're letting them put weight through their palms. So when you talk about letting somebody weight bear after you fix them, what exactly does that mean for you and what kind of variations are there? It means either platform weight bearing or standard weight bearing. So that could be through your palm using a crutch or a walker. I think most patients prefer platform because it's slightly more comfortable for them. But undoubtedly in our series, there were people mobilizing with crutches, you know, which means palm weight bearing through their forearm post-surgery. So my current practice, it's the same thing. It's whatever the patient will tolerate and whatever they need to mobilize is fine by me. Okay. Now, in our practice 20 years ago, we we would routine, we would allow, we have the same problem you have being in a level one trauma center. And we would allow immediate weight bearing, uh, but always with platform crutches. Um, and we all also routinely added a sarmiano forearm cuff. 
I'm not sure it helped much, but it made made us feel better. Yeah, I, I don't I don't have much to add um, as well. I mean, I, I think that's the big advantage of the eight courses is it just allows you to weight bear um, however you would like to weight bear. Um, and I think that's the big advantage. I've got a couple more questions written down, but I wanted to give Seth and Aaron a chance. If you guys had something, just chime on in. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I guess listen to the discussion talking about eight quarter C's and, and even six and maybe pushing down to four. Um, some of the newer trends involve, you know, intermedullary implants for, for both bone forearm fractures, whether it's, you know, rigid fixation for the radius and then uh, intermedullary for the ulna or even for both. I mean, as far as the whole panel goes, what do you guys feel about that kind of stuff? Well, nobody said anything, so I'll comment. Uh, we use quite a bit of uh, intramedullary nailing in my practice. Um, it was not uncommon at the, when we first got started plating the radius. If the ulna was uh, fairly straightforward, we would um, very commonly drive a rush rod down the ulna and not open it. It was very quick, easy to do. And um, and there were various other, um, as you know, uh, I am nailing system designed specifically for the forearm that we used over time. And about the only downside is that um, it's very difficult to restore the the uh, the radio the bow proper bow of the radius with those systems. And the incidence of non-union was pretty high. Uh, I'm not sure because we must have introduced some distraction across the fracture and wiped out the medullary blood supply. So I would say over time, we, unless it was some reason that we didn't want to, you know, have a longer OR time and just was saving time by ramming a rod down the ulna, uh, we gradually wow. drifted away from intramedullary fixation, but we used a lot of it for quite a while. I, I, I would echo that. I mean, I, I personally don't see um, any role unless it's a you know very very special circumstance like a routine both bones forearm fracture i think requires um two plates um i think we know that um the union rate um with conventional plate fixation is high it's you know 98 percent um and we also know that the margin of error with respect to reduction um it's pretty tight um and malunion um, does affect um you know functional outcome so um, you know, if you're looking at um, nails, I mean, one of the problems is getting a nail um, that's rigid enough to, um, you know, allow the fracture to heal, but flexible enough to deal with the um, anatomy. And certainly even the ulna, as we now know, is pretty much not a straight bone. I mean, people used to call it a straight bone, but it's actually got, um, you know, quite a complex shape. And, um, you know, getting um, the anatomy wrong um, in both those two bones, I think, um, results in outcomes that aren't as good as the outcomes that you can get with uh, rigid plate fixation. So I would advocate strongly for um, that as opposed to the use of IM nails. Yeah, I mean, you could go down the same line of thinking of like pushing to less cortices, such as four. We have, um, we have a solution to this problem that really isn't broken. It has some of the highest union rates of fractures anywhere in the body with a proven algorithm with plate osteosynthesis. So I, I, for me, totally 100% agree. Don't really see an indication for it. Aaron, Seth, did you guys have anything else you wanted to ask? I do not right now. It looks like there's one more question on the Q and A. Um, again, with the talking about the number of cortices, do you guys let patients who are not polytraumatized who don't need to weight bear right away return to weight bearing if needed, uh, or if they want to, I guess, return to work or do anything that they need to do with their arm after fixing it? Yeah. For. Um, if you get eight good cortices on either side of the fracture, that, that, that is the advantage of that treatment algorithm for me is that you can forget it. So you can let them weight bear immediately, even if they're not polytraumatized, they can start using that arm sooner. You know, I have no data to support this, but I suspect that 
people get a fact faster functional recovery because they start using that arm sooner as opposed to being immobilized for potentially two weeks in a hard dressing and then another four weeks in a soft dressing with non-weight bearing. I just let them get out and start using their arm for activities of daily living and whatever, whatever type of weight bearing um, they wish to do. I'd agree. Nothing to add. Um, one of the things that unfortunately is because of time constraints that we cut out of our video, um, we kind of went a little off topic and, and down a bit of a rabbit hole talking about how we can kind of apply, you know, these same principles of immediate weight bearing to, to other upper extremity injuries. Um, you know, we kind of talked about how, you know, a lot of us are doing that for the clavicle already in the same polytrauma setting um, or, or a mid shaft humerus. But um, how far do you guys see this same concept going as far as you know, maybe more towards a, a distal humerus, a distal radius, or, or something that would be, you know, maybe not quite as comfortable about, you know, a mid shaft fracture with letting them weight bear. Articular fractures for me are a different ball game, and we'd probably need some literature out there to to be more for me to be more convinced that that was safe to do, just because. I think there's less inherent stability in articular injuries. We're typically restoring an articular surface that may or may not be impacted. And, um, and there's not a great salvage when it goes south for those injuries either. And so um, it, we may get to a point where we allow intraarticular distal humerus, periarticular elbow fractures, and distal radius fractures to wait for as tolerated. But those are ones where I would certainly like to see some data before I started pushing the envelope. Yeah, this is a philosophical comment. Uh, you know, <clears throat> motion is life, life is motion. And uh, the earlier your patient can use their extremity in a normal fashion, it, the better off they're going to be, both in the short term and the long term. So the challenge to all you guys is to develop internal fixation methods combined with biological assets that allow these patients to just go out and start using their extremity. Yeah, I, I certainly agree with that. I mean, I, I would say though that um, I, <laughs> I must say I still hesitate as it relates to articular fractures. I mean, I, I think there's good evidence in the humerus to um, allow early, early weight bearing. I think, you know, the clavicle, um, I really worry about um, the distal humerus. I do worry about the distal radius for me. Um, I think that may be down the road, um, you know, when we have better evidence and better implants, but in 2022, um, it's a different um, animal. We're getting uh, kind of close to the end. So I hope no one hates me for bringing up a new topic, but um, what do you guys do whenever you have segmental bone loss and both bone forearm fractures? Are you acutely bone grafting. I know you talked about that a little bit, Dr. Chapman. Acutely bone grafting, do you ever do a cement spacer and come back later? Um, what's your kind of, what is your practice for those? Well, Dr. Yeah. Shemis and Dr. Marchand should comment first. I mean, I, I, I personally um, don't do any um, acute bone grafting. Um, I um, find that sometimes what I think um, um, won't heal um, acutely um, surprisingly does. Um, I think that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is, um, you know, if there is um, bone loss, um, then I worry about doing an acute bone graft um, in the setting of a fracture. I think it um, increases the risk of infection and I think the graft often resorbs so so um, in my own practice um, I, I don't do any um, acute bone grafting um, I think if the defect is um, large enough then I'll usually um, do like a masculine um, uh, technique where I'll put a um, block of cement in there um, and then come back and do a bone graft um, six or eight weeks later yeah my practice pretty closely mimics that. We know a lot about quote unquote critical size defects in the lower extremity. We know less about what that means in the upper extremity. And I couldn't agree more that a lot of these that you may think would not heal in in the upper extremity will um, fill in a defect. 
but let's just say you have a two centimeter loss of bone. For me, that is absolutely a cement spacer without acute bone grafting coming back at a later time point. That is mostly driven by the fact that if you have a two centimeter bone loss um, situation, the soft tissue envelope is typically not primed and amenable, I think, for an acute bone grafting. I worry about uh, reabsorption of an acute autologous bone graft as well as uh, infection risk. Well, as you know, in our series, we use bone grafting for exactly those indications. And, um, I, and I think one of the big surprises for me over the last 20 years has been the fact that Dr. Shemish and you guys have shown that's not necessary. And the vast majority of these do well without bone grafting. So why do it? Um, the other side of the coin was that in our series, uh, we had, I think, essentially no complications. I think we had one, as I remember, one or two infections, but essentially no complications from using the bone graft. And our donor sites were pretty minimal. Uh, it was, it was typically, as I mentioned, just a drill hole in the, in the iliac crest and a little bit of bone scooped out with a curette. Um, but you've guys proved that that's not necessary. And I, I like the approach that Emil um, suggests using. I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, for, for what it's worth in our series of 200 plus bolt bones, um, a third of those were open and none of them were acutely bone grafted and saw a pretty high union rate for what it's worth. Okay, well, that thank you guys again. Thank you everybody for participating. I think that was a, uh, I certainly learned a fair amount. Um, so hopefully everybody that participated can say the same, uh, but we're about at the uh, end of the, uh, the whole thing. So uh, thank you again. Uh, be looking out for that that eval coming if you want to get your, your CME credits um, and, and consider looking into the other AO videos and, and joining us again in the future.